if, if once if you go to Mars and you're coming in at, at hot and you're coming or you can you're coming back to Earth, you're coming in. If you come back from from Mars to Earth, mm. you're coming in very hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not clear whether transpiration cooling could succeed could there. Up there. Yeah. Um, you're, uh, here's my wacky, dumb idea of the day is uh, on the inside of the tank, if you had like a thermal camera, you have like a fire hose with cryogenic coolant, just spray if there's a hot, a burn through, Sure. spray it down from the inside. I don't know. I'll just, I'll always be happy to yeah. throw out the dumb, the dumb ideas. There's a lot of ways to solve the problem. Yeah. So the, I mean, what matters is that it is solved. Yeah. Uh, even though, like, yeah, there, there are many ways to achieve uh, full reusability. Uh, what matters is that it is achieved. Yeah, 100%. Um, and then but once you're in the sort of over the hump of full reusability, whether one system is slightly better than the other is a secondary concern. Right, yeah, it's tomato tomato at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So the Starship Rotisserie. Let's take a quick look at the actual model. So I have a SpaceX decal here and I'll just move them off to the side. We'll take a closer look at the outside. Now these squares here, the blue and the green, uh, they're meant to be tiles. And what I'm thinking when it comes to reusability is you're gonna to wanna to 3D print the exterior. So in order to do that, you need to have a printer. And if you're gonna print on a 3D object like this, this is the way to go, right? So you've got a flat plane and then this thing can basically circulate around and it can move up. So you can move it up the entire length of the object, 3D print around it. You can remove, you can add and it can create metal along with ceramic patterns. And then when it gets up to the top and you can make ablative things as well, different materials. So again, you can go and 3D print right up to this point. And then this is the reason why you have a round top on here, right? And that's because You 3D print this way, right? So you can go up to the top, right? You can rotate around the top and you can 3D print back down to the side, all with the same head unit. And yeah. So that is the 3D printing portion of the exterior of the Starship. And then there's the rotisserie part. So obviously it has no flaps, all the flaps taken off. And part of the reason for that is, of course, the ability to spin. And why do you need to be able to spin? And the reason is because the heat is going to end up coming in and it's going to end up It'll come in and it'll hit like this area right here. See that? So that's like your your flame area if you're coming in on an angle. And so when you're coming in, if you can spin the ship, then you'll have the cold side and you'll have the hot side. And then that's where the liquid oxygen tanks comes in. So by going and making about uh, half a meter, I guess, of a thickness throughout the whole length down into here. That means that the 9 meter fairing ends up with a 8 meter uh, interior, which then can hold a 7 meter uh, payload, which is the size of the new Starlinks, as far as I know. And so the top here has vents so these tanks are meant to be at like six bar maybe eight so barometric pressure so one bar is pressure that we live in so this would be like six times more oxygen so it'll end up being a liquid oxygen tank both of them and then the idea is that when it's coming in for 
uh, re reentry. So the bottom tank will end up uh, expelling into this body tank. And then the engines will end up drawing down here. So the oxygen gets dumped into the main tank, which then goes all the way down to here and feeds the engines. This is the methane tank in the middle. So it ends up being close, but then the Starlink satellites are on the bottom. And the way that works, because you're probably curious about it, is if I grab this whole thing, Okay, so you can see here, let's see, I'm going to leave that one, it's the tank. So this unit will come down to about there, right? So you see it kicks out the bottom, and then the pucks come out this way. It's kind of like the Pez dispenser idea, so it comes out scoots out into space the next one so then this unit would then probably go up grab the next one bring it down hockey puck it right so and the rockets they would need to have like a pressure fit somewhere under here so this unit would have to be able to go up back into the unit here and then it would have to reattach to the tanks so would have to actually unhook and rehook back up in order to allow this mechanism to work um, so there's that and you move it back up they might have the ability to move all the way up there leaving this empty and then you're like well why would you do that well actually no because then the engines are kind of the bells can only go so high maybe they're positionable maybe you can adjust that i'm not sure but but then you could have access to the um mechanism that allows you to refuel right so then another ship can dock to this one and then they can hook up together and refuel so I'm not sure how that would work. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to have the actual rocket platform as its own separate thing. But that's part of the design of the rotisserie starship. So the main idea basically is that you take all the things off the outside, such as the flaps. You end up with these doors here. Now, I didn't go over the doors, but uh, these doors... They're basically uh, rocket pods. So they pop out. Not very, they don't come very far off the body, right? But they have thrusters. So that way you have the thrusters in the upper half, and then the vehicle has to turn in order to thrust in that direction. So it'll need to be able to rotate. And then in this direction you have a pivot so this is the for the grab arms so it pivots out and it locks in you can kind of see the idea behind that one but it pivots out locks in and then it gets caught by the uh, tower when it comes in to get grabbed so there could be like damage in this area and that's where the 3d printer would come in where it would come in, you'd take it into the shop, put it onto the the 3D printer, and then that would then uh, grind down these areas and then reprint them. It would have to be like a thousand degrees in the room with the 3D printer. Like the 3D printer would have to run at a thousand degrees. And I'm also thinking that the tank itself would have to be uh, inflated to like, I don't know, 1.5 bar when it's getting 3D printed. And the reason is just to keep the surface nice and tense and tight. Maybe like a two bar uh, inflated during the 3D print. Because um, otherwise I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you would end up getting that kind of temperature like for the, for the ceramic. 
to mount to the surface. If you have an extruder, like let's say instead of extruding uh, like a single strand, right? Like this is what you'll be extruding is like little, little bricks almost, right? With then uh, the orange. So then the orange area would end up wearing out quicker than the, the black area. So then the printer would have to come in and take off all the surface of the black and then until it's down to the layer of the orange and then 3d 3d print the surface again and these tanks so this one will end up being exp expended like it'll be down to the two bar the tank will be at two bar um, by the time you're in space and then this one will probably be expended as well to a point but then this one is going to end up being used for cooling so that's why when it's coming in for landing this one's expelling oxygen cold cold oxygen which then goes down all the way down here and then is expelled either through the engines or through some sort of valves at the bottom here and so you'll actually have uh, a form of internal cooling uh, one of the other things i was thinking about was when this is out when this unit here is down like so right you almost want to have some sort of cooler like a vent or a cooling unit that can then cool or reduce the temperature so it's a radiator uh, you're gonna to have to have batteries or some sort of power source going on in here i would think that during the venting if you could somehow connect i don't know an electric motor to the tank and just be able to recharge off of uh expelling gas like i don't know if you've got that's a good way of recharging the batteries and such but anyway uh if you have the cooler the cooler then can go and cool the oxygen down even more because the colder it is same with the methane um, the colder that these fuels are so when it's in orbit it could actively just stay up there and work until it's cooled down enough that uh, it can then come back in for a re-entry and use some of the oxygen the ice cold oxygen in order to make it so that you can have a thinner heat shield because that's really all you're doing is trying to have the thinnest possible heat shield the lightest one in order to get back uh to, in order to do the job basically so this is the concept i don't know if it's a good idea but figured i'd put it out there and let you guys figure it out so thanks for liking and subscribing thanks for checking out the video and come back for more video game action as well as crazy rocket designs and other futurist interesting ideas which is kind of what i'm going for so at least that's what it seems like i'm just basically going for whatever i'm interested in and so if you're interested in the stuff that i'm interested in then like and subscribe so i'm not sure if the ceramic coating is going to be 100% necessary I was thinking about beryllium like what if you were to go and dip the tank in beryllium and have an, a beryllium exterior or have uh, beryllium 3d welded pieces that kind of loop underneath the ceramic in order to hold it in place so you may not need ceramic at all if you use a beryllium outer coat because it can handle up to 3000 degrees but I don't know if you can bring that much cold temperature in order to reduce uh, the overall heating of the object i think you need to deflect it by using the heat shields or ablative shielding so having like a, a pure uh, steel rocket uh, i don't know if we are going to be able to get away with that but you know even if the 3d printer isn't necessarily a printer it could be a 3d placer so it actually places all of the tiles onto the rocket and maybe even has a way of removing and installing them and if they're damaged or cracked you know maybe that would be a quicker way of do it doing it so anyway lots of ideas let's keep them going
Vehicle is pitching downrange. Right now, we're we're getting closer to re-entry. You know, we're going to be moving at hypersonic speeds of more than five times the speed of sound. We're going to see that plasma start to build. So, Kate, Jesse, excitement coming up. Yeah, as you can see with that view on your screen again, high def brought to us by Starlink. We can see the plasma beginning to build as the ship is getting closer to the Earth's atmosphere. Now, how, how, let's talk a little bit about how Star will survive reentry, hopefully, and control itself. Exactly. We've been talking about this this entire flight test. There's 18,000 hexagonal ceramic tiles surrounding the bottom portion or the Earth facing oh, side of the ship. Now, during atmosphere, Reentry, the vehicle is going to see temperatures as high as 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit or over 1,400 degrees Celsius. So those tiles are there to help protect the vehicle from this extreme heat. And if you keep you keep an eye on our speed, the speed is dropping. We're, we're hitting the thicker part of the atmosphere now. The speed's going to start dropping precipitously. We're going to start getting to, to transonic pretty soon. And then after that, we'll get into subsonic, where we're, we're moving less than the speed of sound. But wow, what a light show so far. External temperatures are starting to come down. Again. This camera view is looking right at one of the, the forward flaps. And we're, we're strategically putting some cameras around the vehicle to just look at the, the different areas. Ooh, looks like we got the flap starting to come apart a little. Yeah, it does appear that we have a little bit of burn through there. We can see pieces of the vehicle flying off. What a show it has been. It's been like watching Interstellar or something. <laughs> This is wild to see this, but the ship is still coming down. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see through, the, through the, the, the lens, but we're still getting the feed. Subsonic, they're telling us it's traveling below the speed of sound. That movement means the flaps are actuating. I think we can see something. Uh, Starship is now uh, 11 kilometers over the ocean. All this data is incredibly important. Even if, uh, you know, it breaks up right now. Okay, we can see that flap actuating through the glass. Okay, the next milestone will be initiation of the flip maneuver and landing burn. Landing burn start up the starship. Alright, good news there. Landing burn start up. Landing burn. Landing burn, shipping. 